So many seeds were planted um, in my life growing up, growing up in the church, uh, but a seed was also planted for me through music. Um, one day, my mom always said, don't watch MTV. <laughs> but it was back when they played music videos. Um, and it was one of those things that I just didn't listen to because I've always had an affinity for music, like all kinds of music. So at 11, I saw Kirk Franklin's video for Stomp on MTV. If you don't know who that is, he's like one of the biggest names in gospel. And that was the first song that went mainstream, like as a gospel, it was playing on regular radio, showing on TV. Um, so I heard the hymns growing up my whole life, but that was totally different to me. Um, and that just like stuck with me from then on. I never liked singing in the choir, so I didn't like the formality of it. Um, as you can imagine, I'm sitting up here with no shoes on. With my legs on. Um, I didn't like the formality of the music. I didn't like the robes. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, I also dropped out of chorus and band because I didn't like the formality of that either. They really wanted me to play instruments, um, and I just didn't like it. It was just too structured. Um, and because of that, I still can't read music. So God has a funny way of bringing things around full circle. And now as a worship leader, as someone who actually has a severe fear of public speaking and being in groups of people, um, sitting sits here very comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there for you. Looks comfortable. Um, yeah. So, so from there, that's kind of when my interest in gospel and Christian, Christian music grew. But as a kid, um, it kind of became more like trendy. And I cared more about, at that time, being known as the girl that loved Jesus more than actually loving Jesus. Like, it was an image thing. Like, um, like you're going to, because it was different. So so I stood out. Clearly, I like to stand out. So to me, at that time, it was like, I'm, I'm standing out because, you know, it, it became like an image thing. So I wasn't reading the Bible. I wasn't doing anything else but having these gospel songs mixed in with my secular music that I was already listening to. Um, but through that, still seeds were being planted. I had the WWJD bracelets. I had it written on my basketball sneakers. It was my first tattoo on my ankle. I got it the day I turned 18. She didn't want me to get tattoos either. Um, so, but as a kid, I think like that's the equivalent of the adults who put on their church face, like portraying something that we're not, and then going back and living just like the world Monday through Saturday or whatever your day is. Um, I think that that's like a similarity in that. In high school, I'd say I had a regular social life, um, regular in terms of drinking and smoking underage at parties. That was regular in my social circles. Um, I was by no means a follower of the crowd ever, but bes despite being underage, I feel like in my mind, it was just like, if you don't drink and drive, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, what would you just do grace on one wrist and beer on the other hand, uh, Saturday night parties turn into sleepovers, but then get up early and go to church the next morning, uh, but for what it's worth, I don't really remember anybody else getting up early to go to church, so I mean, it was pretty bad. <laughs> um, so since I'm noting and full transparency, I wasn't ever a follower, um, I also didn't sleep with any guys in high school, and that was not the norm in that regard. Um, I don't even really know why, except that I just felt like something was always coming just don't do that part yet. Um, but when I got to college, like most kids, all bets were off. The parties were more frequent. I did have a boyfriend. I was no longer pure. Um, and attending church was kind of like out the window during that time. Um, not that I was purposely rebelling. It just it is, is what it is. Um, and a, another thing that I should note, being like a big part of my childhood was in high school. I still have them now, but not as frequent. Um, in high school, I had pretty severe uh, migraines that kind of hindered me attending school and like playing sports and stuff. Um, so by the time I got to college, they were getting worse and it was hard to miss class at that level and stay on top of your grades. Like it was easier in high school to not go to school or miss practice and then still, you know, get by. So um, I ended up quitting the basketball team because of how bad it was. And up to that point, basketball was like my life. Um, I didn't even know what I was majoring in, but I knew I was playing basketball in college. So in a lot of ways, I found my identity in physical pain um, in retrospect. And it's easy to do that with any kind of thing that we go through, whether it's physical pain, emotional, whatever. You kind of find your identity in that the longer that it lasts. Um, you know, so in that case, nothing was really working as far as medicine, so I just kind of 
found my comfort in you know my relationship with my boyfriend and social gatherings with friends and stuff um, and I think it's so easy to just find your identity in whatever your thing is mm -hmm. um, and you kind of get lost in that like whatever your title is you know I found my identity in being the class clown and being the athlete like that's where my identity was um, you know found my, my identity was being a wife but like now my identity is not a worship leader. My identity wouldn't be like your identity is in Christ. It's not whatever that title is or that thing that you're that you're burdened with. So, anyways, fast forward. I go to college, and this longtime boyfriend that I had, come to find out, was cheating on me with a coworker. So, once that relationship ended, and that was kind of like my first real relationship. Um, so then I in turn had an inappropriate relationship with my coworker. Um, close down the ship. Go to the bar. Spend time repeat week after week. It was not a very healthy time in my life. Um, but not long after that season of what seemed like fun at the time was really just self-destruction. Um, my mom suggested I go online to meet a guy because you don't want to meet somebody at the bar. Um, and I was initially apprehensive, but I ended up meeting my ex-husband on Match.com. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a fairy tale relationship. We didn't fight. We did everything together. My family loved him. Um, it was golden. Um, like, you know, when you see on social media, like, these couples that they're just like, eh, and then, like, you know, like, they hate each other when they go home. That's not really, like, what you saw was what it was. Like, it was for real, just like that. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of relationships or relations with men, like, up until my marriage. Um, but they were all kind of off, whatever they were, however long they lasted. And I don't really know why that is, because... I had the illustration of a godly man in my father my whole life, showing me how a woman should be treated. And for whatever reason, I went in the opposite direction of that every single time. Um, so I don't know why that is. Maybe that was just a part of my rebellious spirit that I had as a kid. I don't know. Um, so when I met my ex, it seemed like this was someone that was finally close to what I saw in my dad. Um, but in retrospect, I think he ended up marrying me out of obligation and feeling social pressure more than anything. Um, but even still, it was also a fairy tale wedding. It was, people still talk about it. Um, it was an awesome time to cap off what was a long fairy tale type of relationship. Um, too good to be true because it was. After about a year and a half of being married, um, he became a bit distant out of nowhere. He was showing interest in a coworker. Um, we talked about it. Thought we were past that, and then some months later, I came home from work and everything was packed. Mm -hmm. He planned to be gone, um, but I had gotten home earlier that day. Mm -hmm. And he'd already secured an apartment, and that was that. He didn't want to be married anymore and said he needed a break. Um, he didn't want to talk about anything uh, and claimed that he would swing the mortgage and his own rent payments during this time that we were figuring things out. Um, he moved three times during our separation, but never moved back home or pay the mortgage. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was fine. Um, so, <laughs> unfaithfulness, infidelity, abandonment, separation, divorce are all too common to <clears throat> society as a whole. Um, but if you haven't experienced it, these types of things, um, you definitely know someone close to you that have, and it's just one of those things that you have no idea what it's like till you walk through it. It's just. It's just one of those things. Um, but what makes this more interesting is for six months, I lived a lie and told no one. His sister knew and my friend knew. So there was someone to check in on both of us. Um, so we have a huge family, I have a huge family, circles of friends, lied to all of them. It was such a shock that initially, um, I really believed that he would come back. And then once I accepted reality, it was too far, far gone. I couldn't figure out how to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do it by myself. Um, so I asked him if we could tell our family, but he wasn't really communicating with me at all. Um, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed. And I think once I really accepted the reality, I was more concerned with the feelings of everybody else that loved him too, um, to try and explain that I don't know who this guy is anymore and you're not gonna either. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I knew it was spent on the wedding, but I mean, more so I knew the cost of all of this to everyone emotionally. And I, 
just ignored it because I didn't know how to bear with it. So for six months, I pretended everything was normal and he was at home and life was great. And um, so on top of the emotional mess, I was dealing with a different kind of physical pain um, that had began in the latter part of our relationship. I had this un unexplainable pain um, in my abdomen like all the time. It was running to my back, sometimes down my legs. Um, for like a solid year, I didn't eat anything because everything made me sick. I was sick leading up to our wedding. I was sick on our honeymoon. Um, I saw a bunch of doctors and I had a whole bunch of scans in a short amount of time to figure out what's going on. Um, and had a few ER trips during our separation. Um, and then I finally had a surgery scheduled to figure it out because scans weren't showing anything. So I, it's like I see a light at the end of the tunnel to find out what's going on. And at the same time, I'm trying to figure out how everything ended so abruptly where it derailed. Um, so those are just like examples, but like how many times are we dealing with this duality all the time in our life of like the good and the bad. Um, for me, I think as I continue to grow in my faith, though, the realization of the need for these valleys and mountains like we sang about, um, that it has to coexist and it has to be what, it's what fuels our faith for those two things to exist together. Um, <coughs> always have these high points, it's easy to think, why do you need God? Mm -hmm. And then if it's always low, then you're just subject to be like, where is God? Did you need yeah. mm -hmm. um, So it's that balance of the good and the bad working together. It's like the equation for our faith to remain thankful for his grace, trusting in his faithfulness at the same exact time. So a few months after, after he left, um, I just remember sitting on my bed and out loud, I just said, I can't do this anymore. Um, I can't, I can't do this on my own. Um, and like I said, I, 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 I never was not a believer. I always grew up in the church. I always had a belief in God, but that day I turned my life over to Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, but I was still living this lie. Um, but I feel like in doing that, it gave me the strength to live every day as it came, because like every day was a struggle. But then comes the day of my surgery that I've been looking forward to, and it was the first of three surgeries I've now had to date for um, just a pretty bad case of endometriosis. So that day, my parents had a feeling that he wasn't going to be at the hospital when I woke up, and of course they were right. Um, so it was easy to lie because he worked in healthcare and he was in school, and so I always had an excuse for where he was. Like I always had an excuse for his absence because his schedule wasn't regular. So when I was in recovery and he was nowhere to be found, that's when they really started to worry. Um, so my, my procedure ends, takes four times as long as anticipated. It's one of the worst cases they've seen. Um, I took a while to wake up and ended up having an unplanned overnight stay because the pain was so bad. So meanwhile, they're not worried about me and him because he's nowhere to be found not answering his phone. They called the police to do a wellness check at the house. And um, my neighbors tell them that they haven't seen his car there in months and that's how they find out that he had left and I'd been lying this whole time. Um, but the beauty of all of this is that I dove head first into serving um, when this all came out. And so I was serving relentlessly at my home church. And it was kind of an escape, but obviously that was God's plan for me. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in Meriden at the time and I would travel 45 minutes multiple times a week to serve at my home church and I was just, I was, I was all in. I was doing the media recording sermons, I was working with the children, I was a part of leadership, I was directing, directing the Sunday school program. Um, I was pretty much the right hand assistant for the pastor at the time. And I just, I was just in it and that's just where I, it was just like, that's where I put my focus. Mm -hmm. um, but early on I kind of treated God like the genie from Aladdin, like, if you do this, then I'll do that. Yeah. Like, like prayers, like fix this. If you fix all that stuff, then I'll I'll be like this walking testimony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. here I am. <laughs> so we did fix it, and I am a testimony, obviously. Um, and none of it is how I thought my life would look. It's a million times better, but. Um, I believe the Lord called me to stand for my marriage, and I didn't believe in divorce. Mm -hmm. So we were basically in a standoff. Like, he was waiting for me to divorce him. Um, 
And at the same time, I'm just growing stronger in my faith. I'm still praying for him and working on myself. Um, but one of the hardest parts of being alone was being alone. Mm. I'd never even lived alone. I went from home to roommates to marriage, and I didn't, I didn't ever do anything alone. Um, I didn't, I didn't know how to do life like alone. Um, I had social anxiety, and I didn't ever go anywhere without him, or knowing that like my family was going to be there or mm -hmm. my friends were going to be there. I wouldn't just. I wouldn't have dreamed of walking into a room like this to talk to people, like, like not in a million years. Mm -hmm. So it was just big, like learning how to do everything on my own. So like, it's like, it took what I thought was losing everything to find myself and find my voice in more ways than one. So for almost, actually more than three years, um, I stood for my marriage and I, that's what I thought I was doing, but I was, I mean, I was standing for myself and the covenant with God. Um, but I needed that time. It was essential to who I am now. Um, so it was super hard, but like beautiful at the same time because I just, I think I really needed that season um, to come out on the other side, like transformed. So almost two years later to the day of that first surgery, I have a second surgery for the same condition. Um, and when I got home from that one, the divorce papers were taped to my door. Mm. So because of COVID, uh, the divorce process took like eight months and then court was on Zoom. And then I just got an email telling me I was divorced. It was like the weirdest thing. <laughs> sure. um, so that same year, it just, it feels like, okay, like, things are gonna calm down. There's just been like one thing after another. So then that was in May. And then um, later on in the year, my mom's sister, my aunt, um, a cancer that she's been battling for years starts to progress. And in the fall, so that was, I got divorced in the spring and then in the fall of that year, um, she went to be with the Lord five days after her 60th birthday. And so then, um, we were close and it kind of rocked the family, so I did take bereavement time for that. The day I returned from my bereavement time off, I was let go from my job, um, a company that I've been with almost 13 years. So I never <laughs> lost faith ever this whole time, but um, I think it was at that point that I was like, I did have a few like, come on, God, <laughs> moments like, it's just been one thing after another for a number of years. But, um, so here I am before you. Um, what's the punchline? Don't ever lose faith, and prayers don't expire. Amen. Um, yes. So, that's very they don't, they don't, but we don't expire, they don't expire. Not men. So for most of the time that we were separated, there was almost zero communication from him. Um, and I just remember clear as day, there was one day I was just kind of at my wits end with just like the state of like, like it like wrecked my finances and just like the whole situation, everything. And I'm just like, like, what am I supposed to do? And the Lord said clear as day, just keep extending grace. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay. Um, so that, that left an impression with me because it was just a time that, I, again, I was like, like, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So four months after I lost my job, um, I now have a career in ministry insurance. Um, and I'm all in with a lot of other ministry roles in music and leadership. Um, and I was living in his house that whole time. And he sold it last summer to avoid foreclosure. So I moved back to my hometown now. I'm closer to my family. And last summer I just bought a house in the original neighborhood where I grew up. Um, but to really bring it full circle, um, like I said, I didn't even know this when I was first asked to come here. But last year I decided to try the online dating thing again. And this time it was a Christian app. Um, I was kind of on and off of it. But... So four months ago, before my third surgery, 
of the same condition. The day before, um, I get a notice from somebody on the app, and I hadn't really been paying attention to the notifications, and um, I was on the road for work. I was trying to squeeze in a bunch of church appointments because I had surgery the next morning. And so normally I wouldn't even pay attention to something like that because I'm like focused on what I'm doing. And um, I could barely make out his picture. There was like nothing in his bio, but something told me to respond. So we talked a little bit that afternoon, just like while I'm working. Um, and then he reached out early the next morning and I'm, I'm not a morning person and I would have not normally been awake. <laughs> but I was already at the hospital at like four in the morning getting prepped for surgery. So we talked the whole time I was waiting to go in and then we've literally been talking ever since. So it was the first time I came out of a surgery with joy and not like more devastation. Um, and it's hundred percent a God ordained union the way it's all been transpiring. Um, he moved to Connecticut the year my marriage started to fall apart. We have similar stories of growing up in the church um, but not really coming to know the Lord until our lives were like shattered. Um, we both since rededicated our lives to Christ. We both live and breathe lives in ministry capacities. Um, and so full transparency, again, we both desire to approach this relationship different than any other dating and purity and waiting until marriage, um, which is something that neither one of us would have even thought about um, before now. Our God is a redeemer and a savior. Yes. So to close on that, a couple months after I moved into my new place, I was walking my dog in the neighborhood, and at the end of the street, lying on the sidewalk, was a Bible open to Galatians. So I text him, and I'm like, I need to figure out why. Like, I need to pray. Like, why was the Bible there? Like, whose is it? Why, what, why is it open? Why is it open to, to Galatians? And he proceeds to tell me that Galatians is a part of his testimony. It's the first book of the Bible that he had read in its entirety, um, talking about how the flesh and spirits in constant conflict, making everything clear to him of what he was going through at that time. And it was just like, in that moment, the Holy Spirit was like, God's timing is impeccable. Um, the last prayer that I prayed in 2018 to like fix my life was what brought me to my salvation. And it was pleading with God to just fix everything. And it was like that day when I saw that, the Lord just told me, I'm living in the answer to the last prayer I prayed before I gave my life to Jesus. Wow, that's beautiful. So serve God while you wait. Break out of your comfort zone and serve others. If God answers our prayers, in our way and in our timing, what, what would we learn from that? There's no growth without struggle. More importantly, understand the purpose in your waiting and understand that there are others that need to be blessed in the process. Always wait with expectancy. So whatever you have going on in your life, you can't see how God is going to move on that thing today, tomorrow, or in 10 years, but he will. So on one hand, we're just like the people that we read about in the Bible because they didn't know how God was going to work until he worked. Right. So they were living with a blind faith, trusting in the miracle power of Jesus without reading about the miracles first like we have the ability to do. Um, so our faith, to a degree, is still based on what we see mm -hmm. in Scripture. It allows us to see that Jesus might have to take some detours on the way to us, though. Mm -hmm. sure. If you have no idea who's getting blessed along the way through your patience mm -hmm. and your faithfulness, so you're, all, you're always going to be okay. You're better than okay. You're better than you think you are because mm -hmm. you're a daughter and a child of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. So that's like the end of my story, but I just want to share one more thing with you because um, this just had an impression on me. Mm -hmm. a, a 
I shared this with a handful of people a few weeks ago. Um, the Lord just like woke me up out of a dead sleep, and I was like, "No, I just want to. I've got like a long day tomorrow." Um, <laughs> and so he was like, "Wake up and listen to me." But obviously, I fought it all night long because I didn't really realize. And then when I woke, woke up in the morning, I was like, "I have to write this down. I, mm -hmm. I'm gonna like burst." Mm -hmm. So it was just like this super long thing. Like I sent it, I sent it to my, I sent it to some of the band, I sent it to my parents, I sent it to Joe. Um, but what the Lord was impressing on me is that being vulnerable and honest is so essential in the process of restoration. Testimonies are important because they not only provide peace and freedom to the speaker, they provide a source of relatability to the listener and a deeper comprehension of why things happen the way they happen. So I'll forever be amazed by how everything and everyone is connected, how our lives are connected through the good and the bad things that happen to us. How God connects and sometimes reconnects people that need to walk the same path or head in a different direction. Which he impressed as well on me in the heaviness of many testimonies, the things we experience in our lives are almost always a result of generation. Mm -hmm. Curses or blessings. Mm -hmm. So when sin enters in and it keeps, multi it keeps multiplying until individual surrender happens. So in the same way, generational blessings continue to multiply until someone rebels. Mm. With that, there are others that have a testimony of God's faithfulness that is based on the prayers and intentionality of former generations that came before them. We are all a result of seeds that were planted. Mm -hmm. It just depends who did the harvesting right. in those seasons for what kind of fruit we would bear. Interesting. You said this in the car right too on the way up. There's only two groups of people, those who follow Jesus and those who follow the opposition. Mm -hmm. There is no in between. While we of course have free will, we're driven by one or the other, but most don't realize when they're directed by the ways of the world. Yeah. But to allow Jesus to direct your ways takes intentionality. It doesn't have to take a near-death experience to see that. But often that's the illustration because the old ways die when we take Christ as our Savior. The old man dies and we are born again. Hearing someone's story can have a way of convicting us too. I heard a sermon recently on the story of the bent over woman, which again is a physical illustration of what keeps us bound, but the message draws the question of what keeps you bound internally that people can't see. Many of us don't wear what we've been through or what we've done or what we've seen in our lives. We don't, it's not, it's not illustrated on us. So think about those people in your lives that don't have peace. They're quick to anger, they're anxious, they're fearful, they're full of pride, all of those things. They're bound by those spirits of oppression, often because they're in denial or hiding things that they've done or experienced. The spirit of shame is just as powerful as the spirit of judgment. It's very real and it can keep us bound. Fat, skinny, poor, healthy, outgoing, reserved, the offended or the offender. Think about what season are you seeing people in? Have they recognized who directs their life yet or are they still in bondage? Mm -hmm. Loving like Jesus does is way harder when things get real, but it's more than possible when we intentionally choose to see each other through his eyes and not our clouded lens. Mm -hmm. So I believe as we continue to lay it all at the cross Jesus. and carry our cross, we continue to grow closer to each other as a people, as a church, and through that, closer to God. And that is where the revival happens. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.